Thank you. Uh, I'm Sebastian. I'm a data scientist at Ion Channel, which is a company I'll be telling you about in just a bit. I'm also a PhD candidate at UC Berkeley's School of Information. So I'm speaking for my day job at the minute. But uh, when you talk about supply chain management, what we're often talking about is the process of bringing a commodity uh, into production and distribution. So your shirt uh, came probably from a retail store that was distributed to there from a factory where they made it out of raw materials. Uh, and when we're talking about supply chain management, often what we're concerned with is the weakest link. Because if something goes wrong along the way, then the people that wind up using the commodity uh, wind up not getting what they want. And it's a little bit of a leap, perhaps, to start going from uh, physical supply chains to software supply chains, but uh, a great example of why this matters is the Heartbleed bug. So you'll remember in 2014, OpenSSL is a widely used cryptography library. It had a bug in it that led to a buffer overread vulnerability. Uh, about half a million secure servers uh, became, were discovered to be not secure. And so after this event, a number of groups came in to fill the gap, and one of them is Ion Channel. And so what we're doing at Ion Channel is building a data platform and service that allows organizations to manage the risk in their software supply chain and increase the robustness and resilience of their software infrastructure. And we're using scientific Python tools for a lot of our tooling around this, especially Pandas, NetworkX, and some other libraries. So, as a conceptual matter, I want to talk about the difference between resilience and robustness in software. Um, if you want to talk about how robust a system is, maybe a good comparison is uh, a house of cards and the Death Star. So a small vibration is enough to take down the house, uh, the house of cards. But the Death Star actually can take a beating. The problem with the Death Star, as you'll remember from Star Wars, is that it has a weak spot. And if you hit the weak spot just right, the entire thing explodes. Compare that with Iron Man's suit. Iron Man's suit can also take a beating, but if it takes damage, all the nanorobots start working and it starts repairing itself. That's what we want out of a software ecosystem. We want something that's not only just robust uh, to a lot of attacks, but one that can adapt to when it takes damage. And uh, I didn't have a good example for something that's resilient and fragile in life, but a uh, kind of software stack that's in perpetual beta that never has a stable release but has a really active team, that's, that's how you could think about a resilient, fragile software system. So thinking in that way about it, we're trying to get a new approach. And it's an interesting problem, it's a really interesting problem, because uh, the open source ecosystem, and really it's many ecosystems, there's a lot of complexity to it, uh, and there's a lot of data available, because something that open source projects are great at is spewing off tons of data from their production processes. Um, and if we could start attacking this problem from these overall robustness and resilience indicators, in anticipation of all the various unknown attacks and problems that might happen in it, uh, we've got extraordinarily interesting problem, and one that is not, it's not immediately obvious how to make it tractable. One way we've found to approach it is to take inspiration from another case where uh, people have successfully managed risk in a very complex environment, and that is disaster risk reduction. So if you're trying to figure out how to mitigate the negative effects of, say, an earthquake or a hurricane, you have to deal with both a living economy of people and things and also, you know, changing weather patterns. And uh, here's disaster risk modeling 101 in one slide. Um, you can analytically break down the problem. And this is a way of breaking it down that's been proposed by Omar Dario Cardona and used uh, very widely by the World Bank around the world. So you start talking about the risk from uh, natural hazard. A uh, natural hazard being a earthquake or a tsunami or a landslide. And ex the exposure are the buildings, the people, water pipes, the, the assets, the valuable things you're trying to protect. And uh, the subtlest part is probably the vulnerability uh, factor, which is really the mapping from the asset 
uh, and its properties and the sort of impact of the hazard to the damage that will be done. So how much a building will be damaged when it shakes based on the properties of the building or the susceptibility of a water pipe to a landslide. And I'm uh, oversimplifying things a lot here, but essentially in this modeling framework, the risk is a product of the hazard and the exposure and the vulnerability. And the benefit of using such a framework is that you can identify when, say, a small earthquake in a low density area with weak infrastructure uh, is more damaging or can be predicted to be more damaging than a large earthquake in a high density area with uh, very strong infrastructure. So there's a real example of this um, when around the same time there was a terrible earthquake in Haiti and a stronger earthquake in Santiago, Chile. Uh, the earthquake in Haiti was actually much more damaging because of the quality of the infrastructure there. So how can we map this onto questions of software security? Well, for hazards, we have security threats of all kinds. And for exposure, we've got software components in use. And for vulnerability, we have fragility in some sense. And for the purpose of this talk, I'm abstracting away a lot because we're kind of zooming in from a bird's eye view down to this problem. I sort of approach this complementary, I think, to the way the most security research works, which is you start with a very specific threat and you start building up from there. So uh, because we're abstracting away the threats into sort of a generalized uniform field of danger, we can just simplify and say, Risk is pr uh, proportional to exposure times fragility. And then we need empirical proxy variables for the components of this model. So what we're starting with is uh, exposure is just number of unique downloads on each package. Right? And fragility, how can we get at this? Well, if we assume, and it's a kind of significant assumption, but if we assume that fragility goes down with each subsequent release, and we have the number of releases for each package, we can say, okay, let fragility be the inverse of the number of releases. And so for a package in isolation, we can get a simple metric. It's the number of downloads over the number of releases, and we can get all that data, for example, in the Python ecosystem from the PyPy API. But that's missing out on this whole question of software dependency, which motivated the whole work. So here's the logic to it. Say A, say some software package A depends on some other software package B, say OpenSSL. Then the vulnerability in OpenSSL propagates up to software package A, the web server, say. And similarly, the exposure of the web server propagates back down to the OpenSSL, say. And there's exceptions and complications to this. You know, someone might fix some problem upstream, not push things, or fix the problem downstream, not push back upstream. But for the sake of uh, a heuristic analysis, we can go with this for now. And so if you have, uh, these are some examples, these are some directed graphs where uh, the uh, nodes that are First in the topological order or towards the center, the sort of leaves are towards the edge. And if uh, you start with the one in the middle where say the size of a node is its initial value, exposure propagates to the core. Right? The core libraries take on all the exposure of everything downstream of them. And the vulnerability propagates out to the leaves, taking on all the vulnerability of everything upstream of them. And uh, you can use this to find hot spots in the total topology. So if uh, on the left, size is uh, proportional to exposure and the color warmth, the sort of yellowness is proportional to vulnerability, and you run this analysis, you can point to, well, here's a particular node, this is the yellow number three on the right, where uh, you've got the most expected risk in this whole system. So we tried this out on PyPy uh, using uh, the requirements from the install requires part of each setup.py. And we visualized the network with Gephi, 
and it's G-E-P-H-I, and it's an excellent tool. And so what are these gnarly, risky parts? Any guesses? The uh, big mess at the upper right, that's all the packages associated with Zope and Plone. And then uh, also worth noting is the package six. Six is two times three. It's also a Python library for integrating Python 2 and Python 3 components. Six has a ton of downstream uh, dependence. And all that exposure piles up onto six. I don't know whether six has undergone a very thorough security review, but it might be worth doing. For Zope and Plone, um, if you were doing web development in Python 10 years ago, you've heard of Zope and Plone. Uh, Plone is a content management system, and it's built on Zope. Zope is a uh, web application framework, you could say. Um, but if you go to the Zope website now, you see Zope is a legacy framework. It'll tell you. Say, don't build anything new on it unless you really know what you're doing. But they do insist that it has an outstanding security record. And that's kind of interesting. Uh, because we, uh, so you can dig into this, and what is the security record based on? And it's relevant, because there's still a, a lot of people using Clone. I, mean, I could name organizations you've all heard of whose websites still use this. And it turns out the security, re uh, security reputation is based on the number of vulnerabilities listed in the Common Vulnerabilities and Exposures database, which is a public database of exactly what it sounds like. And they, uh, there's some blog posts uh, that will say, listen, Plone has so many significantly fewer severe vulnerabilities listed compared to WordPress and Joomla and Drupal that it must be outstandingly secure. And this has made it so far as the Wikipedia entry on Plone. This is so much part of the conventional wisdom about the security of this uh, content management system. On the other hand, it's not a great comparison, because uh, one thing, all those other CMSs are in PHP. And if you compare, say, Plone with Django, they're very comparable. And uh, it might also be because Plone is just far less popular than the other projects. There was a uh, hot minute in maybe April 2004 where Plone was searched for more on Google than uh, Drupal, WordPress, and Joomla. But this is the Google Trends chart. You can see it was pretty quickly outstripped by the others. And uh, so it could just be that the small number of vulnerabilities is due to, recorded vulnerabilities, is due to the amount of uh, effort that's gone into inspecting them. Uh, we don't know. So uh, bottom line is validating this kind of risk management framework is very difficult, because even when there is ground truth data available, such as the CEV data, um, it's not straightforward to interpret it. So in future work, we're going to have to model the life cycle of these software projects and get expected vulnerability discovery rates, start getting at this problem, start saying, okay, well, where do we think there's something anomalous going on? Um, but in the meantime, I just want to insinuate that Plone might be a lot more like the Death Star than anyone ever expected, because however robust it is, if it has a security problem in it, no one would know, because no one's looking at these core libraries. And uh, that's sort of the upshot of the analysis. And uh, if you're a seasoned engineer, you're probably saying, well, it's so much more complicated than that, because you know, package dependencies are not always straightforward. You know, Package version 0 0.1 can point directly at package version 0 0.1 another thing. but you might get uh, another future version that points at a sort of a, a greater than or equal to version number in a different package. So which packages get installed will depend on the time at which it was installed. It's actually a really messy but interesting problem. So there's tons of cool future work on this, including incorporating other kinds of data, like data from issue trackers, dealing with these version dependencies, dealing with cyclic dependencies, all the exceptions to the heuristics. There's many different uh, open source ecosystems to compare. There's NPM, there's Maven. So this is really only the beginning of what I think is some really exciting research in supply chain risk management open source. And uh, that's all.
So uh, Ion Channel, you can find us at ionchannel.io. Uh, there's a great research team behind this, including myself, Travis Pinney, JC Hertz, and Kit Plummer, who's the CTO of the company. If I have any questions, you could shoot, shoot an email to him. And that's uh, me at the bottom. I'm my academic address, sbidhighschool.berkeley.edu. And that's it. Any questions? Hi there. This looks like excellent work. I'm looking for tools to help me identify things before I use them. So for example, when I go to a GitHub repository, I look at number of forks, number of stars, number of watches, to give me some feel for do people care about this. I then look at number of commits, how many people are committing, what is their quantity of commits. Those give me confidence that the project is active, I could be resilient. Are you looking to build some kind of scoring mechanism that takes into account these kinds of activities to help us guide, to guide us in choosing systems that are more likely to be security robust and resilient? Yes, exactly. That's it? <laughs> you got it. Hi. Um, the, um, your measure of risk seems a little bit ad hoc. Uh, have you considered, like, extreme value theory for doing this? Um, it's, it's supported both in R and Python. Um, it's, uh, it's basically a probabilistic method that, um, you know, in the same way that central limit theorem lets you look at uh, sort of central tendency, the extreme value theory lets you look at your extremes. And so if you have something like CVE or whatever else like that, if you can measure it like a score like he mentioned, uh, you could actually calculate probabilities. And the theory is used to determine flooding events, like extreme flooding events or, or large snowfalls, et cetera, currently. Like I said, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a useful theory that you might consider looking at, if you haven't already. We haven't. Thank you so much for that. That is an excellent recommendation. I'm going to look it up. Anyone else? Okay. Right. Thank, Thank you so you much. Thank you all so much.